Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Today we've got another gun gripe episode for you. All right, <laughs> this one's gonna ruffle some feathers. I'm looking forward to this one. So we're gonna go over the guns that are the worst guns for beginners. Okay, so I feel like we have to preface this uh, video with a disclaimer. We're not saying these aren't great guns that we're showing off because I own these. I mean, I obviously like them mm -hmm. because I own them, but these are guns that might be a little bit difficult on the top end of the learning curve for a newbie. Probably not the best choice. We are gonna dive into this. This will be a lot of fun. Uh, I would like to take a moment to thank our friends at Sonoran Desert Institute. They have some amazing gunsmithing programs, really great instructors. If you're looking for a career in firearms technology or if you're looking to become a gunsmith, check out their programs. Really great group of people. Um, they accept all kinds of financial aid, GI Bill, all that good stuff. So if you're a vet, Put that GI Bill uh, to work for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Get your financial aid going and get you some education. <laughs> All right, so we are going to dive into this concept. And uh, <laughs> well, you know what's what's yeah. scary is uh, there's a couple of these guns on the table that I may have bought early on in my firearms journey, and like, why did I buy that? It's so hard to shoot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but anyways. Where to begin? Okay, so I think the way that we the way we begin in this particular video is we discuss, I think, the criteria. Okay. All right, what makes a gun difficult to use for a newbie? And I think that we can uh, sort of separate this into some general categories. One, recoil. Yep. Right? Firearms that generate a ton of recoil force are generally harder to, mm -hmm. harder to shoot. They are also harder to learn how to shoot accurately on because you develop a crazy flinch with really high recoiling guns. And it also um, sets an unrealistic expectation for what recoil on a firearm should be. And so, I, yeah, well, I think too, uh, control. Like being able to control the firearm as a new shooter. You know, you haven't really learned how to really handle a firearm to the point where you can shoot something big bore. Agreed. And be able to control it and be safe. I yeah. think that's the big thing, Yeah, too. especially some auto. So I think one would be recoil forces mm. are definitely um, something to consider. Uh, the other would be the cartridge that the firearm shoots. Okay, mm. we do have some guns on the table we're going to go through that shoot some oddball stuff. It's not very commonly available. In some cases, not available. Mm. So obviously, you don't want to buy a gun that you just about can't get ammo for or that uses... Um, you know, some kind of weird cartridge that's very difficult to get. So that's one criteria. Um, two, I would say complication, mm -hmm. like uh, a gun that has a complicated action or maybe a firearm that has a very specific and deliberate uh, manual of arms mm -hmm. to operate that if you're not schooled on how to do it, you can get lost pretty quick. Um, mm -hmm. A firearm that comes to mind really quick is the Franchi Spass 12. Mm -hmm. Not a beginner's gun. It's a really weird gun to use. If and you're it's not heavy too. Yeah, they're heavy and they're dur not very durable, yeah. right? So they break parts easily. So that could be another criteria. Yeah, Maybe parts, a, parts availability, that yeah. sort of thing. Parts you availability know. is a thing. So we are going to dive into all of those with the firearms that we have here uh, on the table. So okay. lead us well, off. Where, uh, where do you want to go? Well, let's talk about recoil. I mean, okay. you want to talk about recoil uh, when you consider recoil forces. All right, 458 Winchester Magnum. All right, this is not a good beginner's gun, okay? If you go out to the gun store and you're like, I want to buy my first rifle. I want a 458 Win Mag. Uh, do you now? No. These generate a ton of force. This is what's commonly known as an elephant gun. Okay. I mean, stopping it, rifle. Yes. Big so, game rifle. I mean, this is this is a gun that you can take down the largest animals on this planet with, and it generates a ton of recoil force. And you have to have a very specific stance. Uh, in order to control and wield this weapon appropriately. I think it's worth noting um, that the 458 Winchester Magnum and the 458 Lot are actually mm. on the entry level of big bore yes. uh, cartridges. So they do make some cartridges that get into some absolutely bitter territory that and if you... we've shot them before. If you don't know what you're doing, the firearm will physically yes. cause you bodily harm. Um, I've got a 9.3 by 62 uh, Ruger M77. This is an M77 and 458 Winchester mm -hmm. Magnum. Uh, both are actually on the entry level of stopping rifles, right? Uh, both these guns have taken the big five. They've mm -hmm. taken tons of game in Africa. Dangerous game. We're talking animals that can maim you and kill you. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a gun that can generate uh, the forces necessary, obviously, to uh, put down a very large and dangerous and angry animal. 
uh, probably not a gun for a beginner. In fact, if you go on a on a hunt in Africa, they're going to administer a little basic shooting test. All right. And most of the guides in Africa are going to want you to be able to take whatever rifle you use. You've got to be able to hit a pie plate from shooting sticks at 100 yards. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, they're not going to take you on the hunt. Yeah. Now, granted, the hunt's going to be closer than that, but they figure if you can hold the rifle steady and, and shoot a pie plate at 100, you're probably okay to have that round in the boiler room. Anyway, I digress. Mm -hmm. Big bore rifle, uh, not a good beginner not rifle. Cool. All right, so... I want to buy my first shotgun. Well, I want a uh, SB2 single shot 18 inch <laughs> pipe gun. Now, I mean, this is a 10 gauge. So with, with single shot shotguns and single shot rifles, okay, like this bolt action or well, a repeater like this bolt action here, all of the recoil forces are being put into your body. All right, there is no semi-automatic action to take some of those recoil forces out of the equation and make it a little bit more pleasant shooting experience you get the full brunt of whatever you put in this. All right, this is yeah. 10 gauge. This yeah. is bigger than 12 gauge, okay? When you're talking about shotguns, as the numbers get smaller, they get bigger. The pain okay? increases. <laughs> but this, Not a beginner's gun. This is a single shot 10 gauge shotgun, and uh, normally these have tungsten and weights in the buttstock to kind of alleviate some of that recoil force. They, they kind of reciprocate back and forth a little bit. Eric has removed those to make it a more uh, pleasing experience, but... These guns are not for the faint of heart. Just like we mentioned with the Ruger here, okay, these require a certain shooting stance and position and you know experience to be able to control this firearm. Uh, this is not a good first shotgun I mean, by any stretch not of the a, imagination. Not a beginner's gun. <laughs> uh, I would so in general, I would not recommend a 10 gauge <laughs> no. uh, as a beginner shotgun. Now you can also buy single shot uh, shotguns in like 410, mm, absolutely. 20 yeah. gauge. You can get a 12, obviously, and those make outstanding beginner shotguns because it's a simple uh, action, yeah. easy to operate, easy to reload, and <laughs> if someone's shy of recoil, you don't have to worry about handing them a semi-auto yes. that they might accidentally shoot a second shot yep. by mistake it's one shot yep. and done and it's a great way to expose people to a given cartridge without having to have a lot of complication mm. going on also with 10 gauge like there's no like double a 10 gauge loads okay there there's no bird loads for 10 gauge unless you're talking about a, <laughs> a, a high power turkey load okay with 12 gauge if you got a single shot 12 gauge you've got access to very light uh, loads that would be used for like sporting clays and such. Those are very, very easy shooting loads, especially in a full size shotgun. Okay, yeah. but like 10 gauge, there ain't no such thing as a light 10 gauge load. If it says 10 <laughs> on it, boys and girls, it's, it's going to be a ride. You better hold on. And they kick hard, you know. They do. Guns that weigh more and are repeaters aren't quite as bad. Like the Mag 10 yeah. is not a bad shotgun to shoot. The BPS in 10 gauge mm. is a little heavier, longer barrel. Not quite as much recoil, but it's still. Uh, packs you're, punch. you're getting into a large shotgun at that yeah. point, and it's kind of getting into that unwieldy territory, yeah. you know, especially for someone who's new to guns. Not a beginner's gun. All right, okay. Speaking of uh, hard to control. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> this is a four-inch 500. Uh, so this is Smith & Wesson uh, 500 Magnum, Man. and this definitely represents one of the biggest bore production revolvers that you can buy without going into something that's custom or uh, specialized, especially in a double single action frame. Uh, this represents the top of the heap. I mean, it doesn't get crazier than this in terms of felt recoil, big giant pills going down range at a relatively mm -hmm. fast speed, even out of the shorter barrel. Mm -hmm. um, this gun is a handful. It's not a beginner's gun. Mm -hmm. I know you guys have probably seen tons of viral internet videos that show some hapless little 90 pound woman in a bikini. I know you've seen her and she's shooting a 500, and what happens? A big old Desert Eagle or a 500 Magnum flies back and hits the uh, mm. unscrupulous person right in the face because they don't know, and their friends were evil enough to hand them it knowing that it was gonna yeah. kick. And you have to have a, a very good purchase on the grip. You gotta hold this thing just right, mm. and you gotta kinda ride the recoil. You can't fight it. You know, people just, when they're new to guns, they have this this sort of fear that's in their minds. They think, oh, the gun's going to kick hard, right? Well, imagine if you were a new gun owner, and I handed you this with a 500 grain Lehigh in there, or Underwood, you know, 500 grain gas check cast bullet that is like loaded to the maximum uh, potential that this cartridge can do. And I handed you that, and that was your first shooting experience. 
you would probably go, you know what? I never want to. Like I never want to shoot a gun again, yeah. because that is the performance standard that you have set for yourself, and your friends who put that in your hands for your first time set you up for failure uh, when they did so. So also not good for a beginner. No, not at all. Now also one thing: these big bore revolvers can be very dangerous. Okay. Now, Eric mentioned viral videos of people whacking themselves in the head, all right, with these things. And now, I've seen videos where folks have gotten a second shot off, okay, after the first recoil impulse completes. So they're shooting this this revolver, and they go, okay, click, bang, it comes back here, and they're still, you know, they're still pulling the trigger. The trigger resets, okay? They, they, their finger comes off of the trigger and they squeeze it again and it goes off inches from their head. Now, or into another person. Yes, and now this has and happened. that has happened. Now, that is completely irresponsible on, you know, your part. If you give that gun to somebody who is very new to firearms, that is a firearm that is for an experienced shooter who has handled larger bore firearms in the past. These can be downright dangerous. And I will say this, like, look, if you want to let somebody shoot a 500 that just wants to try it, maybe they've never shot one, put mm -hmm. one round yep. in it. Let them give it, you know, a try a couple of times. That's always a good rule of thumb, mm -hmm. right, is to just put a round in it, let people take one shot, and it's just something to think about. And, yeah, and, and again, I'm not saying the 500 didn't awesome. These things are mm. great. I love them. I mean, they just put big old holes in things. Dude, and it's wonderful. the world's most powerful production handgun. I mean, yeah, what's not to like? Especially in the VXR, like the oh, long God. barrel. Dude, you get some <laughs> wicked velocity. And it's worth <clears throat> noting, the 460 is awesome as well and actually has a bit less recoil and still boasts some really impressive ballistics. Anyway, yep. not to nerd out, but the 460 is worth looking into oh, as well. Such a great cartridge. All right, so we mentioned like hard to find parts, hard to find ammo. Um, and you know what's weird is like we're making this video and a lot <laughs> of the rifles on the table, well, at least two of the guns on this table, I've had for a very long time. Mm. And, we're, and these constitute what would be some of my earliest gun purchases. And one of my very early pistols I picked up quite early on was a CZ-52. Mm. And uh, at the time... The reason I bought it is because, gosh, they were just dirt cheap. I well, mean, the ammo was dirt cheap, too. And there was a ton of surplus out there available, mm -hmm. and it was nothing. I mean, it cost half of what 9mm cost at the time. Yeah. You know? I will say this. So th this gets into that SPAS-12 territory. The firing pins on these things are brittle. The extractors are brittle. Uh, you know, they aren't the most robust guns, and the parts are not exactly mm -hmm. quite as easy to get. And it does require a very specific manual of arms also requires a very specific disassembly process to clean and take care of. Most of the 762 by 25 ammunition that's out there is corrosive. Yeah. So you gotta follow really strict cleaning protocols to keep the gun from rotting to heck and back. Yeah. They kick really hard. They've got a lot of recoil. They're decently accurate. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would say the ammunition, uh, the weird ammunition in combination with the strange design, the magazines are pricey, the disassembly is complicated, the parts are brittle, namely the firing pin. It's not a good candidate for a first gun. It's cool, like this is something to add to the collection if you've already got a few pistols and you want something cool like Comlock uh, to add to the heap. But a first gun, mm. negative. Yeah, a little bit complicated. Yeah. Um, now, talking about obscure ammunition, all right, we have another gun on the table that is strikingly similar to that. This is the FK Bruno. All right, now, this is a very heavy handgun. All right, and this is actually the <laughs> lighter version in FK's lineup. They have a uh, full-size field pistol version that is all steel and is a very heavy gun. I mean, th these guns are touted, you know, for being able to pierce body armor at 100 yards. These are long-range hunting handguns okay there's been guys that have taken a lot of medium-sized game with these guns they use a very obscure and very expensive cartridge the uh, 75 Bruno. it is a neck down cartridge it's basically like a small 308 projectile uh these are not for the faint of heart and these are a little bit more expensive firearm as well yeah. um but relatively simple manual of arms and such but some uh, hard to find components, okay? Only one company obviously is making this particular firearm. But this is one of those guns that I, I don't think you would go out and buy, you know, first off. I was like, I, I want an FK Bruno uh, PSD as my first, you know, carry gun. Cause, all right, so 
it's a large gun. This is not something that you would be carrying on a regular basis as a modern handgun. I think I that mean, you so. kind of start to get into the territory where you get into a 500 Magnum or a Desert Eagle, or in this case, the FK. This is this gun represents probably, in this day and age right now as this video is being made, this is probably one of the most advanced and modern handguns in mm -hmm. the world right now. I'd say so. I mean, the cartridge it fires is just really next level and really, you know, awesome and, and capable of lots of really cool stuff. And uh, the thought and process that they went through to design this pistol, I'm not saying it's not a great gun. It's a wonderful gun, mm -hmm. but not a gun for an inexperienced shooter. Mm -hmm. um, it does kick a bit especially this gun being the lighter version, you know, the polymer frame, uh, does have some recoil, mm -hmm. although not bad. Okay, and to be fair, okay, you do have the nine millimeter barrel that you can install in this mm -hmm. and be able to shoot nine millimeter with the conversion mag. So, all right, let's just say maybe you wanted something that could do a little bit of both and you wanted to be able to shoot nine millimeter mm -hmm. for your plinking and practice, which many of us can agree is a perfectly acceptable beginner cartridge. Mm -hmm. But then you can drop in your 7.5 barrel or your 10 millimeter barrel, and now you've got a hunting pistol. So this one gets a pass. Maybe <laughs> not the best gun for a beginner. Probably, yeah. I would say, the most relative thing is expense. Mm. Uh, they are relatively expensive. Uh, the ammo is pretty expensive and highly proprietary. But if you want uh, a culmination of you know, some really awesome handgun technologies, mm. Uh, it's, it's top of the heap kind of pistol. It's, it's really neat. nice. Um, my my big thought with it was being a modern polymer framed gun. Uh, we always tout in other videos when we're talking about beginners guns. You know, a good polymer frame handgun for a beginner is like a Glock 19. Okay, because most people want a gun that they can carry and conceal on their person. This gun is really not in that ballpark at all. It's not really one that most people would consider as a, a carry, uh, like, you know, I'm going to carry it uh, appendix style in my waistband, you know, under a t-shirt, and that's going to be my everyday carry. Mm, not quite. At the end of the day, so, uh, whatever works for you, whatever of course, works for you. Is, you know, you, you do I, whatever your little I mean, heart wants. Look, if you're the mountain, if you're the mountain or something, I mean, you can conceal just about anything on this table. Okay, so we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about obscure cartridges, weird mm -hmm. gun designs, hard to find parts, recoil. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about manual of arms, okay? okay. So let's move on. Oh. So uh, this is our um, Kalashnikov USA um, KS-12, uh, which is essentially a US produced Sega 12. Now look, uh, I'm definitely not taking a poop on this gun design because look, I, I like the Sega 12. And, um, you know, early on YouTube, we cut our teeth on Sega 12 videos. Mm -hmm. uh, we did quite a few on uh, the early, you know, Russian-American armory imports and mm -hmm. all of that type of stuff. And um, I like this gun design. I think it's cool, but I think when you get into the gun world, you're going to generally run into some people that have some differing opinions about these guns. Some people will tell you they're jam matics and they don't run very well and they don't have quite the utmost in reliability. Some people will tell you, hey, my Sega 12 runs like a champ, or my KS-12 runs like a champ. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of varying opinions about the reliability of these guns. Now, can you dispense quite a bit of firepower out of one of these? Absolutely. But I feel like the manual of arms and, um, and everything, this is not a gun for a beginner. This is something that you need to shoot guns for a while to know how to feel like the recoil impulse and how to know if there's a stoppage. And then if there is a stoppage, you know, how do you drop the mag? How do you clear it? How do you lock the bolt to the rear? How do you assess a potential failure or stoppage? So to get proficient with this, especially with some of the minor inherent teething issues, usually magazine and ammunition related, more so than the gun itself, uh, you start to get into a point where, yeah, maybe not quite so much the best gun for a beginner because how many times have you, as an experienced gun person, handed somebody a firearm that is not very, you know, very knowledgeable about guns, and then, like for instance, okay, we've let people shoot the Full Auto 22. Mm -hmm you know, load up a 50 round drum. All right, oh, there's a stoppage. All right, someone who's not a, someone who's a gun person immediately knows. All right, yeah, drop the mag, rack her back, check her out. Okay, cool, we're good. Get her back in action and can correct the issue because they know what, what, how to clear stoppage. And then there's certain people that go, What's they're that? looking at you and they're squeezing the trigger, expecting mm -hmm. it to keep going. Or someone who's really uh, not, not on top of things will go, What's wrong? Ah. Uh, they're doing this number, and yeah. you have to tell people, whoa, whoa, whoa. So <laughs> clearing stoppages mm -hmm. or correcting a potential issue with the manual of operation of the gun or the issue, mm -hmm. you know, the way the gun operates, that's part 
of knowing that particular weapon system or that gun, right? You got to know when something's not right and how to correct it. So a platform that might be a little bit more biased towards having some potential issues may not be a good first choice. It won't be. And also the KS-12s and the Segas and such, they're known to be uh, sensitive to ammunition, okay? Usually the way that they're set up from the factory will be for one type of ammunition or another. You're either going to have low brass or high brass. All right, so low brass is your lower powered cartridges. High brass is your higher powered cartridges. Buckshot, slug, self-defense loads, things like that. Well, for a beginner going out and trying to source uh, you know, the specific ammo for their gun, well, they're gonna have to buy multiple types of ammunition in different power levels to find out what their gun likes. It's not mm -hmm. just like going out and buying a gun and being able to run anything you want to in it. And like Eric mentioned, it is a little bit more complicated manual of arms compared to other shotguns and things like that out there. But the ammunition um, sensitivity, I think, is one of the big uh, detractors for me and why it's on this table. Just as an example for this type of you know, platform, you know, an AK-based 12-gauge shotgun, this magazine fit. I think the general takeaway is that if you ask somebody what's more reliable, a tube-fed semi-auto 12-gauge shotgun or a magazine-fed semi-auto shotgun, 99% of gun owners are going to go, oh yeah, I'd rather have a Benelli M4 than a magazine-fed shotgun. Yep. It's not to say it's not a good gun, it's just different. <laughs> And it may not be for a beginner. That's what we're saying. Okay. All right. Well, speaking of ammunition. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Speaking of ammunition. All right. So, this is my Martini Henry. This one's actually a Mark I. That's such a beautiful gun. With a short lever. So, um, yeah. This is a, a really, really nice Martini Henry. And you've probably seen a bunch of these guns floating around out on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. You know, because of popular culture and popular video games that have sort of... Uh, revitalized uh, the existence of this rifle with a large group of people. Of course, um, there's a lot of people out there that have been like, hey, I'm gonna buy a Martini Henry. And they don't realize that for shooting purposes, they are very, very difficult to source ammo mm -hmm. for. And when you can get the ammo, it's very, very expensive. It uses a really obscure black powder cartridge that especially from a standpoint of making your own or having someone make ammo for you, it's very laborious and it's a very difficult cartridge to make. It requires a very specific set of components, very, very, very specific loading sequence. Mm -hmm. It is not for the faint of heart, but is it for a beginner? No. I would say that a rifle like this now, unless you just want it because it's cool hanging on the wall or whatever, you don't plan on shooting it. You got to think though, for a beginner, we're thinking, okay, someone wants their first gun. Yeah, they want to go out and shoot. They want yeah. something useful that they can go out and use. So the Martini, while awesome, mm -hmm. and while one of my favorite guns, and it makes me so happy to be able to take ammo out that I made and shoot it and go, wow, look at this. And, and when things come together, it's a great feeling and it's very fulfilling, but is it beginner's gun? No. Let's just say that, you know, there's only one or two places, one that I'm definitely aware of that actually draws brass for the Martini. Jameson. And, and maybe Bertram. Bertram right? and Jameson. All right, but it's it's hard to get. I mean, that brass is hardly ever available, it seems. Yeah. So in the case of Eric, what we've done in the past was make our own brass out of uh, shot shells, like brass shot shells. Yeah. Um, and that's a very laborious process in itself because if you don't do it just right, you can crack your brass, you know, the annealing isn't proper, and you fire your first shot and it's just destroyed. But it, it costs as much money that you would put into this rifle to get the loading components that you need to load the ammunition, notwithstanding having the equipment already at your disposal to load ammunition. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. You're not going to walk into the local sporting goods establishment or the local <laughs> Walmart and pick up 577 450 bucks. Um, or, excuse me, you're good just not. sir, at the Walmart sporting <laughs> desk, I seek 577 <laughs> ammunition. I, I require a replacement weapon. <laughs> <laughs> the guy from Jumanji, Van Pelt, Red he comes in with that, that old sporting rifle. Sets Pardon on the me, table. good sir. Do you have ammunition for my Martini Henry? Where is that from? Where's I, that accent? I don't know. It's out of my brain. It's not Birmingham, I can tell you that. Look, I'll, right. I'll, look, I'll start speaking like a Brit, and then I'll turn into an Indian, and then I'll turn into a Mexican. I mean, that's On that note, hopefully this video was entertaining, <laughs> and you guys got a bit of an idea uh, this isn't all of them, and oh, we're God, certainly no. not saying these are terrible options because they're great, maybe just not for the beginner. Yep. So if you are looking to get your first gun and you're trying to look for some stuff that maybe may not be the best choice, this should put you in the right mm -hmm. direction. And uh, again, not saying these are terrible options, mm -hmm. maybe just not for a beginner. No.
Not yeah, at all. So, you know, simmer down. Simmer, simmer down, down now. Take it. Start out small. Work your way Look, up. One I, day you can come to the Mecca. But for, for those of you who take are... Take tiny steps. For those of you who are still here, the third gun I ever purchased was a Desert Eagle. But, but... Guilty. But I did buy it in 357 Magnum. But was... Was it a smart choice? I saved up for like a year to buy that because I wanted a Desert Eagle so bad. And now, all right, at this point in life, you wish you still had I it. I wish I still had it. I did I did wind up selling it, and I bought a revolver, which I thought was a, a more, um, I guess... Practical. Practical option. You know, just a good wheel gun. I bought a nice Smith 686. But I wish I still had that gun, but it was one of the first few purchases that I made. You know, but... At that time, like, there were no YouTube videos to tell me otherwise. I mean, you know, that was way back when, I don't know. Well, I don't want to even think how long ago. You're welcome. We'll be seeing you. Everybody, have a great day. I appreciate you watching today's video. Mm -hmm. i definitely like to take a moment to thank all of our Patreon supporters, those of you who purchase man cans to support the channel. Uh, you go over to <laughs> Ballistic Inc., pick yourself up a snazzy tea. So it's you not can, ours, but... So you can uh, go and uh, buy your uh, big bore rifle in style, okay? <laughs> Have a great day. Many more videos on the way. We'll see y'all soon. We'll be seeing you.